The role of autonomous and uncrewed technology is now at the forefront of many Navy's minds. And here at Navy Tech this week, we've seen a lot of discussions around what this might mean in practical terms. I'm joined here today by Captain Colin Corridan from Task Force 59 and Michael Stewart, the Director of the US Navy's Disruptive Capabilities Office. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to Navy Tech. Thank you. Michael, can I start with you just talking about the Disruptive Capabilities Office and the Unmanned Task Force? What, what do they mean and what implications are they having? Sure. So I'll start first with the Unmanned Task Force um, and where that came from. So the Unmanned Task Force was really a, uh, it was an innovation pathfinder uh, to figure out how we could go faster with disruptive and innovative technologies. At the time, the U.S. Navy was very interested in unmanned technology, uh, and we were trying to figure out how we could utilize unmanned technology in an operational setting. Part of the problem that we were facing was that, in, in some leaders' estimation, it was taking too long to adopt that technology. So the unmanned task force was tasked with take unmanned technology, see if you can adapt it inside perhaps like five years and go really ra rapidly. You know, one of the criticisms that um, the military should typically get is acquisition takes too long and it's, it's no longer relevant. Uh, and I understand where that criticism comes from. And certainly, you know, if you're going to go acquire something like an aircraft carrier or a nuclear submarine, it's going to take a long time, right? So the question really became, could you acquire cutting edge, uh, high TRL technology, commercial technology very quickly using a different system? So that was the unmanned task force, right? Um, Part of the entry for the unmanned task force was really focusing on operational problems that the fleet commanders felt that they needed to be addressed in a disruptive way or a, a new, a unique way or very, very quickly, right? So the unmanned task force lasted for about 18 months and after the, it was run, uh, it was decided to continue it with the disruptive capabilities office, look beyond unmanned. So the disruptive capability office is really looking for any capability that would have a meaningful effect in an operational setting, and potentially a conflict, or something that could dissuade or deter an adversary using disruptive technology and unmanned and autonomous systems and AI it happens to be some of the technologies that we look at. We also look at other things. And insert CTF 59 here because you, you play quite a key role in this. Uh, you, you are one of a few, but you were also setting the trend, weren't you, for how this, this was rolled out to the wider Navy. Why was that and how did it come about? Well, there is a direct relation between the UTF and, and the DCO and Task Force 59. Uh, think of us as the, at the operating at the tactical level, uh, on the uh, operational edge. And we were simply trying to uh, solve uh, some of our tactical problems with innovation, uh, technology, and some disruption, and do it quickly. And uh, we were, we were uh, formed to get after that problem. And this is a, a, bi a bigger difference between the two organizations is we were targeting mature commercial technology. Things that exist in, uh, in industry already, whether it's you know, something that monitors uh, climate or something that you know, helps uh, oil and gas industry monitor some of their equipment. We see value in those, those commercial tech uh, apparatus that we can use for our, for our own good. And getting our hands on them and doing it fast was, was the whole goal. And so um, I, as we've been doing that, that's a very different thing to do at the fleet level. Now, that kind of experimentation and, and, and uh, acquisition of, of different products at the fleet level it normally doesn't happen. Uh, yeah, because I was thinking about that. The Red Sea is quite a specific environment. How do the lessons you learn there translate to the likes of the North Sea or the Atlantic where conditions are, are very different? Right. Um, well, you know, you talk about any harsh physical environment and, and then you bring in uh, complex high level technology. The two normally don't mix very well. What you learn in a, in a harsh physical environment is what really works and what doesn't. And so, and you're, you know, also, in addition to being in a harsh physical environment, you're operating next side by side with the operators who will be the end users of the tech. So you're getting real time feedback. So if you need to tweak the technology, you can do it quickly, uh, get feedback, and then you're getting it right from, from the source. And so um, that, that alone, that idea alone, I believe, is transferable to any, any climate anywhere. 
that idea. Um, we are learning very specific lessons uh, that can be scalable to other places, and particularly in the very dynamic, um, hot conflict that we are in now, we are learning faster than we've ever learned before. And the lessons that we're learning are only going to make us better operators in those different places uh, outside of the, um, outside of the uh, Arabian Peninsula. And how is this feedback, Michael, being extracted from this area and rolled out across the wider fleet? We can speak about the technology, but I, I would go up about 50,000 feet for a second and to so, sort of the l larger lesson I think that we're seeing, right? So, you know, disruptive capabilities, you know, people use the word disruption a lot, but in our case, it's very, it, it's very specific, you know, disruption of potentially low cost solutions coming in rapidly, right? If you talk to anybody in the industry, disruption is not a new concept. You know, think of you know, General Motors in the 1980s being disrupted by Toyota. Think about Boeing being potentially being disrupted by Airbus. Think about Nokia being disrupted by Apple. You know, if somebody comes in very quickly from a, a direction you didn't really foresee, and you didn't potentially or potentially didn't react fast enough or uh, well enough, right? So I mean, we can keep on going with, with with examples. So what we noticed was in the U.S. Navy is taking a page out of Armenia and Azerbaijan, taking a page out of what's going on with Russia and Ukraine, is that you were seeing potentially older, or you were seeing uh, people who had been uh, preeminent before being disrupted by new technologies and new, and new models. One of the things that we noticed with Task Force 59 was suddenly they were coming in, they, they had scarce resources, they didn't have a lot of budget, and they had a problem in that their operational problem was they didn't have w a good enough awareness of what was going on in their uh, area of responsibility in the Arabian Gulf, in the Indian Ocean, in the Red Sea. And the, uh, there was no ability to solve it quickly from what from the way they perceived it. So they went and solved it themselves, right? So they got commercial technology, they adopted very quickly, and then they sh suddenly showed us that you could have a very low cost solution, a relatively low cost solution using unmanned sensors, uh, mesh networks, and, and uh, Starlink or Star Shield to uh, sort of have a a uh, highly distributed sensor network to give them awareness. Uh, and it just showed us that if you, with a different operating model using commercial technology, uh, doing a rapid experimentation in theater, you would learn very, very quickly and then have a, a, have a new entrant for technology you normally wouldn't consider. I mean, it's like a triple whammy of advantages, yes. isn't it? Yeah. You're getting better fidelity information at lower cost, faster, which is freeing up your sailors more time to do other tasks. Yeah, and then let me, I don't want to monopolize, but I'll give you another sort of data point. So if you take a look at the period from, you know, 1900 to 1941, and you look at the U.S. Navy's sort of a, I, I wouldn't want to say a, po a coastal patrol boat Navy, but it certainly wasn't extending its power uh, the way it, it could have. In, that, in those in intervening years, you developed uh, submarine warfare, amphibious warfare, and naval aviation. And the way that we did that was a lot of experimentation. And so if you think about where we are now with the advent of AI, un autonomous systems, uh, unmanned, and you're seeing, again, Azerbaijan and Armenia, you're seeing Russia, Ukraine, you're potentially seeing an inflection point of a new way to uh, have naval warfare. And so we're taking notice of it and we're making, we're making sure that we understand it and we're making sure that you know, we don't get disrupted because you're seeing other, other com countries essentially getting disrupted by it, right? And ta what Task Force 59 for us is really proving technology very, very rapidly and seeing it in theater by an operational commander who finds it useful. One of the things that's been evident out there was a uh, reluctance to embrace some of this technology. Some of these navies are saying they're not ready for it. They like simple systems that they understand, that are cheap, that they can find replacements for immediately. There's quite a lot of resistance out there. How are you sort of breaking down the, these barriers? That's a great uh, question, Harry, and, and we deal with this a lot. And um, I think our approach to this is what makes Task Force 59 so appealing. Um, when will they be ready? That's the question because the adversary is using this technology. The adversary is ready. Um, so, you know, you can't be stagnant, you have to act, which requires bold leadership, it requires a level of acceptance of risk, it requires backing of leadership to support you when you're doing, when you're operating this way. Um, we put a lot of 
we put a lot of thought into how we employ th this technology. But we know that we have to start using it, and that's the difference. At Task Force 59, we are out there and we're doing it, and we're learning some hard lessons, uh, but we're iterating and we're getting better. And that's what we're sharing with our partners and the larger Navy. And we, you, this, this is what, I think this is the big appeal for Task Force 59. You have to be bold, you have to go out, take some risk, do it, mitigate the risk, and be responsible, but you gotta do it. So two points. The first thing is, you might wanna ask Colin what Task Force 59 has spent to this point. It's not a lot, right? And the, the unmanned task force didn't really spend a lot, right? What we were really trying to do and what Colin was doing was trying to take an idea and experiment with it to see if you get to a capability, right? And the idea being that you're not walking into saying, oh man, imagine a world of AI and unmanned. They were actually showing you by spending a little bit of money and showing it to you what it actually would do to you, would do for you and, and operational, the operational effect, right? That's thing one. Thing two is no one is saying this is a binary thing. Like, you know what? Just get rid of all the ships and make them all unmanned. No one is saying that at all. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're experimenting with a very little bit of money, almost like a venture capital firm, to see if there's actually any operational relevance, right? And if there is, then you can make a trade. So you can come in and Colin could come in and say, look, if you want me to do maritime domain awareness in the Arabian Gulf, I can do it for $30,000 flight hour with a jet, or I can do it for much less, you know, and, and maybe they're not equivalent, but this is a much cheaper way to go do it potentially, right? So now with an operational commander, you can see it. I can give you a vignette. Um, I remember sitting and watching, there were two screens and one of them had about 100 contacts on this side and it was uh, people were trying to sort through it uh, in the normal way with radar and telephone calls to try and make sense of it. On this side, you had seven sensors that are integrated with the data going into a data repository with algorithms running with AI. And you could immediately see that the AI would pick through and say not, of the 100 contacts, you know, go shoot one. It would say, of these 100 contacts, maybe those 15 are the one that you're most interested in. And these 15 that are you're completely unaware of because the sensors actually pick them up. When an operational commander sees that and says, okay, now I can make sense of 100 contacts infinitely faster and cheaper than I could the other way, that becomes operationally relevant. And then you bring that to a senior naval leader. And if the operational commander has faith in it, then you're gonna make a trade, right? And so it's an informed decision. It's not just say, imagine a world of AI and I'm just gonna give you a ton of money. Because I think we've seen a lot of innovative technology sort of promise and nothing ever comes. And I think what, what's happening is you're seeing experimentation, you're seeing incremental risk, you're seeing really robust evaluations, again, in an operational setting. So now it becomes relevant, right? And again, you know, what I've spent is probably of Navy money, you know, one just one tenth, you know, one ten thousandth, uh, you know, it's, it's minuscule uh, compared to what the Navy budget is. Mm -hmm. And all we're doing is maturing technology so you can actually see what it can go do. So the integration of this technology actually requires a, a, a team of experts, if you like, to drive it through and show that operational effectiveness to, to whatever level, senior included. Uh, you've just developed Telstra 59.1. Could you tell us a little bit about that and what it's bringing to to the picture? Yeah, here that, that's a great question because this is a new uh, a new uh, evol evolution uh, for Task Force 59 is Task Group uh, 59.1. It was created um, to be the connective tissue between the industry partners that we work with and the operational units that we are going to be providing this technology to. We are not in the business of taking new technology, bringing it to a deployed unit in the, in the uh, operating area where we're at and dumping that on them. Uh, our, our goal here is to be as effective and efficient as possible. So ta task, task Group 59.1 uh, is responsible for deploying to remote areas, introducing this technology to deployed units, and being the connective tissue between them and the, uh, and the, and the um, industry partners that are going to be employing the tech technology because we use a contractor owned contractor operated model for a lot of what we a lot of what we bring into theater and uh, task, uh, they will also be responsible for holding training and so that at the end we are not placing an additional burden on the warfighter yes thanks for telling us a bit more about 59.1 I can see how that will end up having quite strategic consequences and that is being noticed at quite a high level now what impact is it having 
I think it's no secret that you know, uh, once once a week there's usually a story that comes out in the press about how the traditional military is too slow, it can't get out of its own way, it, it's not innovative, it takes too long to adopt technology. And, and if I'm an adversary, I'm going to be reading that thinking, okay, well, I've got time to actually respond to the, to the United States and uh, nothing to see here. If you take a look at the speed at which 59 rolled out, so it went from a, an idea to a concept paper in a month, and they rolled out the first autonomous systems in two months, and it had the largest unmanned exercise within six months, right? That catches people's attention. So now you're adopting cutting-edge technology incredibly quickly. If you take a look at what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, I think the lesson everybody's learning is the innovative cycle that Ukraine is, is utilizing against the Russians. And so, and, and if you look at the, again, what the, the Azerbaijanis did to the Armenians and the way they adopted Armenian technology so quickly after the Armenians had initially defeated them and then they turned that around. I think the lesson that we're learning is that it's not, the technology is fascinating and, and important, but it's a technology, it's, a, it's the rate at which you adopt technology that is just as important, right? And so with 59, I think one of the things that Big Navy is learning is that you, you can really increase the, the speed at which you can adopt technology and it's got strategic effect and hopefully it's sending a message of, don't assume that US Navy can't get out of its own way. We can get out of our own way pretty quickly. And I think it's got to come from both ends of the spectrum as well, right? Absolutely. It's got to be pushed from the top down, but also pulled from the bottom as Some well. Some of the best ideas come from the lowest, the lower levels. Yeah, yeah. Innovation. And I'm genuinely really excited for it. And Navy Tech is part of the discussions, and I look forward to following through on it in the next few years with you both. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Well, thank, thank you for you. having it's us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.